Our special guest for today is Associate Professor of English Education, Dr. Yolanda Celi Ruiz of Teachers College, Columbia University. Dr. Celi Ruiz. Um, and I would like to mention that she braved terrible weather conditions. <laughs> Coming from New York. Yes. Oh my goodness. So you know about the snow, obviously. She made it to Minnesota, got stuck in Minnesota, was in Minnesota for several hours. Yesterday, she, she left New York at 9. She didn't get here till about 11 o'clock at night. So she is a trooper. And I'm just really thankful. There were many people praying yesterday that she was going to make it here safely. And she did. Please pray that she makes it home safely. <laughs> um, OK. So Dr. Celia Rose is a widely respected scholar in a variety of areas, including culturally relevant pedagogy, which we'll be hearing more about today, black and Latino male students, critical English education, racial literacy and urban teacher evaluation, and the educational trajectories of African-American adult reentry women. She's published dozens of journal articles, book chapters, and books on these topics, and came to us highly recommended by Dr. Cindy Price and Gail Moe, if you're here today, thank you, who saw her speak at the Teaching and Learning National Institute. And they came back from that conference just so just brimming with excitement about our speaker here today and saying, you need to get her. You need to, there's any, okay. So you need to, you need to bring her out. We need to hear from her here at SPU. Uh, Dr. Celia Rose was also featured in Two Fists Up, which is a recent documentary by Spike Lee uh, about a series of protests that kicked off at the University of Missouri's football team. Our in-service today is entitled Achieving the Dream of Equity, Moving from Academic Marginalization to Academic Advancement. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I greet you in God's love. I am grateful to be here, and I thank you for having me. Uh, before we begin, uh, usually when I teach my classes, uh, and I teach those who want to become teachers, I often tell them that um, I don't really consider myself to be a teacher educator. I consider myself to be a teacher interrupter. Because I think to claim that we educate, bless you, that we educate um, people is a bit of an arrogant statement, because you're never quite sure where what you're sharing is going to land. But I know that I do interrupt. And I hope to teach them to interrupt as well, sometimes to interrupt themselves, to interrupt the way that um, uh, they think about others, particularly those who are going to be their students in the future. So anything we do in our class, I ask them to think about taking it into their own classroom. And in that spirit, you'll see that there are these cards on the table, maybe in front of you, you might have to share. And they're called life stories. And I am convinced that I made the, uh, I don't know, the stock go up or something. Because when I first bought these about 10 years ago, it was $3 on Amazon. And now the game is $25. Right? I want my share. So uh, what I'd love for you to do is, usually we would do this as a whole table. But I want to have us just talk for about two minutes. So however your body normally shifts to a person, just talk to one other person. Pick up the card, read the card, and share. And then I'll bring us back together in about two minutes. And this is a way of uh, breaking, of course, the ice, but building community in your own classrooms. Hey. OK, if we can come together. If we can come together. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to let you know that I spared you because uh, I talked with Margaret ahead of time, and I took out all the cards that required you to do physical activity. So there's some cards that require you to do jumping jacks or walking backwards. So we spared you for that. But thank you. Um, life stories, it's a wonderful way. Some of the cards are whimsical, and some of them ask you to talk about a memory of your mother or your father or your grandmother. And you can imagine um, if some of those special people in our lives have passed on or we had contentious relationships, that it can open up uh, social emotional windows. So we have to be prepared to use the cards at the right time in our classroom. Um, but it is a way to build a community. You can also create your own set of life stories. Uh, so thank you for that. So we're going to get started. Um, I'd like to. 
say happy birthday, right? It's your birthday, uh, 125 years. Uh, Teachers College celebrated its 125th year um, birthday about three years ago. And I think uh, this number 125 is pretty important, not only because I live near 125th Street in Harlem, but also uh, I've seen in the 125 years how TC has really begun to make some changes. Um, towards a movement of diversity, talking about issues of race and class and gender and racism and white supremacy and many of the things that keep us shackled um, and not really connected to one another. So happy birthday to Seattle Pacific University. Yeah. I want to start out by saying today I want us to think in general, does culture matter in higher education? That's a general question. And more specifically, uh, how does it matter and how does it align with SPU's strategic vision and your tagline, which says engaging the culture, changing the world? And I want us to focus specifically on culture for a moment because culture ha is a fluid word, right? It, it has multiple meanings. Culture can be, for example, uh, no judgment here, right? I'm a boxing fan. Uh, not much is going on in the heavyweight division. But if you go into a boxing match, there's a particular culture. There's a language that's spoken. There's foods that you eat. Uh, there's particular attire, right? Same with baseball, with soccer, and so forth. Um, as well, there's cultures that we're brought up with, right? So we think about big C and little C. The big C, uh, some of the religions uh, that we observe, the foods that we eat, uh, the way in which we practice um, certain ways of being, clothes that we wear, right? That's the big C, and we tend to pass that on to our children. Uh, there's also the small C, which many of us, when we were younger, and perhaps even now, participate in. So if you are into rock culture or hip-hop culture, or a lot of my kids are into skateboarding culture and, and hip-hop and so forth, uh, there's a goth culture that many young people are a part of as well. That's another culture that they facilitate. And then they come into our schools, and the schools have a culture. So if we think about it, right, young people in particular are navigating multiple cultures at the same time. The culture of home, the culture of school, and what I tend to call popular culture, right? And yet, for many schools, including higher ed institutions, we tell them that there's a particular culture here that you have to adhere to. That there's not really space for you to bring in your cultural ways of knowing. And if you bring in too much of it, it seems as though you're veering too much away from the, the uh, community, the cultural community that's here. So I want us to keep in mind that culture is fluid, that it is moving, that it shifts. It makes me think a lot about James Baldwin, particularly um, any linguist in the room, applied linguistics, language folks, okay. So when I think about James Baldwin, who wrote uh, a seminal article, if black English isn't a language, then tell me what is, he captures in that article how language has shifted over time and the cultural impact, right, of the way that in which we speak. So to say jazz me baby in the 60s might mean something very different in the 90s, if we're even talking that way. Or when kids around the 90s were talking about, oh, you look fat, you're so great. Um, depending on the culture you're from, if someone calls you fat, you might want to haul off and hit them, right? <laughs> But fat, P-H-A-T, is certainly a different kind of way of knowing that came from uh, what we would say popular culture. Right? So just having these cultural ways of knowing. Another linguistic practice that I grew up playing in the South Bronx, um, and children still play today, they may not understand the historical significance of it, but there's this thing called the dozens. right? And so in the dozens, it's a, a linguistic um, I would say a, a beautiful sparring match, a linguistic sparring match. And the, f the person who's able to make the snap, the crank, the joke, the woof, to make other people laugh the most um, is the one who wins the sparring match. Now the thing about the dozens is that um, you talk about things that are very personal. You talk about your mother, you talk about people's fathers, you talk about homes, you talk about things that are not funny, like poverty, right? But yet, um, it is a way, it is a linguistic practice that um, children play that's connected to slavery. So during slave times, when uh, slaves were brought onto the plantation, those who had mental disabilities, physical disabilities, were grouped together in a dozen. And they were purchased as a dozen. 
And so when other slaves saw these groups traveling together, they knew they were the dozens and they would make fun of them. And so that's historically how that kind of passed down, playing the dozens. So if you're a teacher and you hear children saying something like, your mother is so fat, you know, she sat on a quarter and made George Washington cry. I mean, really corny jokes, right? But if you hear it and people are, ch children are talking in a particular way, you think that they're being disrespectful. Because you're not familiar, let's say, with that particular culturally linguistic practice, you can misread it. So when we talk about culture, culture comes across linguistically, it comes across in dress, it comes across in ways of knowing. So today what I want us to think about as I share some things for you to consider is to think about what is the meaning of culture in the tagline, engaging the culture, changing the world. What does SPU mean by that, right? So I want us to think a little bit about some of our most uh, vulnerable students and made vulnerable particularly because of the history uh, that we have lived. The US has a difficult history. Uh, it has a history where it has welcomed people and lives have changed. And it also has a history where people have been abused and maligned. And that is what we grapple with as Americans always and those who come to uh, the US. You can go back one, Matt, please. Um, so for many of our marginalized students, the idea of college is, appears to be just a series of obstacles to overcome, right? So the question always is, how do we help to alleviate some of those obstacles and those challenges that are ahead? Right. So I want to share uh, this quote with you of a colleague of mine, and I'll show you the book at the end. She wrote a book on culturally responsive uh, college readiness. And so Amina, who's a female student, said that I know that for me to understand college, I have to be shown and guided by people older than me or who have the knowledge of what is required to go to college. And Amina, as a black female, is not unique. I'd like to argue that many of our young people, particularly if they are from a socioeconomic status that's not middle class or upper class, college might be you know, uh, kind of a dream for them. So they need to be guided. So I want us to keep that in mind as well, because as we talk about culture, it's often conflated with race, it's often conflated with class, right? And sometimes we have to learn how to disentangle them because sometimes children are treated a particular way. When I say children, I'm talking about our higher ed students as well, because of their class, or they might be treated because a certain way because of their race or their culture or their religion. We can go to the next one. So I just wanna talk quickly, I don't wanna belabor it because I think we have enough uh, particularly in the social sciences, uh, we have a lot of research that talks about uh, deficit mind frames and deficit ways of seeing our students. So I don't want to beleaguer that too much, but I do want to hold up these very real uh, issues that many of our students struggle with. So there are structural, which fall under social, economic, and environmental barriers, institutional, that's where we come in. We have to really look at uh, particularly if you have 120 years of history, right? You've evolved and grown over time like TC, and you have to constantly, as your student body is shifting, you have to really look at your institutional practices to see are there policies and practices, and of course, are there beliefs that really make it difficult for some of our students to persist through college, right? Oftentimes, our beliefs impact our practices, and our practices shape our policies. So they're all related. And then, of course, there are cultural, uh, in terms of norms and expectations, what's okay, what's not okay. I imagine this is a Christian institution. Um, if you were to get more and more students from a Muslim religion or Buddhist religion, how would those, how would they feel? Would they feel comfortable, right? How would um, SPU embrace them? And then of course there are personal barriers, um, individual feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. So um, what I want to tell you is that this will be interactive, because I can't talk like this for two hours. So uh, what you're going to experience over our time together, I will pose particular questions that I want you to take up with each other, either as a table or um, uh, one or two people next to you. I will also have an audio that I want you to do some critical listening to. There will be two videos, but it will be conversation and interactive. So this is the first question I'd like for you to take up. What beliefs, practices, and policies do we, SPU, have in place that articulates to these students, the students who seem to be most marginalized, right, either by race, by class, 
by, uh, and I would throw in gender too, but we're specifically talking about uh, race today, um, that they will receive an equitable and relevant education for the context of the world uh, in which they live. All right, that's a, that's a mouthful. But really, what is SPU doing to make these students feel and understand, either in our classrooms, and the community, in the clubs, and the hallways on the campus, to let them know that this is a place where they will receive a culturally relevant education and an education that allows them to be able to navigate a world, the world that we live in. So if you can take that up, just first jot down some thoughts, right? All good teachers give think time. Um, take about a minute and then how it naturally uh, flows, then begin to share. And I'll come back for you in about uh, two minutes. And try to be as honest as you can. This is the day of, let's just peel it back and really try to be as honest as we can. <laughs> is it possible to get one or two people to share, to briefly share? either what one of your colleagues shared or something that has been on your mind and you've been thinking about in relation to this. Can we have some voices, please? One and anyone else afterwards? Okay, and tell, tell me your name. Uh, my name is Karen. Hi, Karen. Yes. So we're thankful for her building that program. Yeah. Yes, support and hold up your people. Um, it's not easy to do this kind of work, and so when you have those who are standing in front and doing it, they need that energy and that support and the allyship, right? And we'll talk more about this being a personal thing, but yes, um, that's wonderful. Anyone else? One more person would like to share. Anything you can, yes, tell me your name. Gail. Hi, Gail. So, um, we talked about um, the student orientation, the bio course, scholars program, uh, biology that is uh, specifically focused on underrepresented uh, students, specifically students of color, and making them successful mentors uh, for seniors. Uh, I could just add to that um, Margaret Stewart from the Center for Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I also want you to think about where you can grow. And one thing I want to say about the word diversity, it's a funny term, right? Oftentimes diversity is just covering for what, what, what are we covering for? Let's just call it out. Come on. What do, we, what do we often mean when we say diversity? Race, right? And sometimes what else are we talking about? Disabilities and abilities. What else are we talking about? Gender, right? And the intersections, class, right? So a lot of times, you know, diversity is such a safe, I think, and clean word. I think race can be too, although it's socially constructed, but we've made it such a dirty word in this country and globally because of the, the history that's attached to it. But I think when we build our own racial literacy, when we realize that we can begin to have constructive conversations around race, um, we can begin to say and, and use the language in uh, its most pure power. Um, so wonderful, and please continue to think about uh, uh, th this question as higher education institutions across the country are really grappling and being honest about this. So what I want to offer is um, a lot of the, the, the videos, the audios that I share are coming out of a particular lens, a lens uh, for the research that I have done over the years. This is my third career. Um, I was in corporate America for 13 years. I escaped. I did. <laughs> And uh, then I was um, a research associate, but also a, a professor, assistant professor of composition and rhetoric 
at Kingsborough Community College. And then I became um, a research associate at the Metro Center at NYU, working with Pedro Nogueira. And that work was very important to me because it really showed an equity right, uh, right there, front and center. And my job was to work around the country, but specifically, when, at one point, New York was my, um, my area to work with school districts that were disproportionately placing black and Latino males particularly, but also females in special education. And uh, we had to work with the districts to look at the IEPs if they could find them, honestly, um, and to really have them see that the process of being in special education after the third year, you were supposed to be um, put in what we so-called uh, call um, general education. Well, what would happen is that special education became the placement, not a place to get services, but a placement, particularly for males and for uh, males of color. And so um, my work with males of color actually has haunted me from growing up in the South Bronx, my days of being in the Bronx, of uh, the girls were given particular treatment. We were put in uh, so-called um, gifted and talented classes, and the boys were not. The boys were put in special ed, the boys were pushed out of school, and this stood with me that I am continuing, here it is almost 30 something years later, I continue to ask the question, what about the boys? And more and more I become concerned about the girls as well, because as we look at some of the rates of special education placement and mass incarceration placement, the same formula it's happening with black and Latino, uh, particular Asian women and um, of a particular class. So just seeing the connections. So what I'm offering are a couple of lenses that come specifically from my work, um, but I want you to think uh, more broadly and think specifically about your students. So if I tend to be talking just about Asian students or at one point about black and Latino students, think also about your poor white students. Think also about some of your middle class white students, right? That um, they live under a narrative that everything is okay and many of them are not okay. So how do we really think about diversity and the broad terms of what we talked about, race, class, gender, socioeconomic status, but also mental ability, right? And um, let's just stretch that term diversity. So some structural and institutional barriers. I want you to, if you want to close your eyes, you're welcome to do that. I have a, a clip uh, that's about four minutes and 36 seconds, so I would like to, us to engage in critical listening. It's from Ta-Nehisi Coates's Between the World and Me. How many of you have uh, picked up that book yet? Okay, wonderful. So it might uh, hopefully be a different experience to hear this piece. This particular piece I pulled out because it talks about education in particular as he writes this letter to his son, um, I want you to think about, I want you to think about the children in your class as possibly being your own children. What if we were to take that up as a moral imperative and we saw them as though we see our own daughters and sons and nieces and nephews, whether they are trans or um, Muslim, uh, certainly Christian. How about if we saw them as our own children? So. Um, Let's engage with Tana Hasey Coates and do some critical listening. I think of this as a great difference between us. You have some acquaintance with the old rules, but they are not as essential to you as they were to me. I am sure that you have had to deal with the occasional roughneck on the subway or in the park, but when I was about your age each day, fully one third of my brain was concerned with who I was walking to school with, our precise number, the manner of our walk, the number of times I smiled, who or what I smiled at, who offered a pound and who did not, all of which is to say that I practiced the culture of the streets, a culture concerned chiefly with securing the body. I do not long for those days. I have no desire to make you tough or street, perhaps because any toughness I garnered came reluctantly. I think I was always somehow aware of the price. I think I somehow knew that a third of my brain should have been concerned with more beautiful things. I think I felt that something out there, some force, nameless and vast, had robbed me of what? Time? Experience? I think you know something of what that third could have done. And I think that is why you may feel the need for escape even more than I did. You have seen all the wonderful life up above the tree line. 
Yet you understand that there is no real difference between you and Trayvon Martin, and thus Trayvon Martin must terrify you in a way that he could never terrify me. You have seen so much more of all that is lost when they destroy your body. The streets were not my only problem. If the streets shackled my right leg, the schools shackled my left. Fail to comprehend the streets and you gave up your body now, but fail to comprehend the schools and you gave up your body later. I suffered at the hands of both, but I resent the schools more. There was nothing sanctified about the laws of the streets. The laws were amoral and practical. You rolled with a posse to the party as sure as you wore boots in the snow or raised an umbrella in the rain. These were rules aimed at something obvious, the great danger that haunted every visit to Shake and Bake, every bus ride downtown. But the laws of the schools were aimed at something distant and vague. What did it mean to, as our elders told us, grow up and be somebody? And what precisely did this have to do with an education rendered as rote discipline? To be educated in my Baltimore mostly meant always packing an extra number two pencil and working quietly. Educated children walked in single file on the right side of the hallway, raised their hands to use the lavatory, and carried the lavatory pass when en route. Educated children never offered excuses, certainly not childhood itself. The world had no time for the childhoods of black boys and girls. How could the schools? Algebra, biology, and English were not subjects so much as opportunities to better discipline the body, to practice writing between the lines, copying the directions legibly, memorizing theorems extracted from the world they were created to represent. All of it felt so distant to me. I remember sitting in my seventh grade French class and not having any idea why I was there. I did not know any French people, and nothing around me suggested I ever would. France was a rock rotating in another galaxy around another sun in another sky that I would never cross. Why precisely was I sitting in this classroom? The question was never answered. I was a curious boy, but the schools were not concerned with curiosity. They were concerned with compliance. I loved a few of my teachers, but I cannot say that I truly believed any of them. Some years after I'd left school, after I dropped out of college, I heard a few lines from Nas that struck me. Ecstasy coke, you say it's love, it is poison. Schools where I learned they should be burned, it is poison. That was exactly how I felt back then. I sensed the schools were hiding something, drugging us with false morality so that we would not see, so that we did not ask. Why for us and only us is the other side of free will and free spirits an assault upon our bodies? This is not a hyperbolic concern. When our elders presented school to us, they did not present it as a place of high learning, but as a means of escape from death and penal warehousing. Fully 60% of all young black men who drop out of high school will go to jail. This should disgrace the country, but it does not. And while I couldn't crunch the numbers or plumb the history back then, I sensed that the fear that marked West Baltimore could not be explained by the schools. Schools did not reveal truths, they concealed them. Perhaps they must be burned away so that the heart of this thing might be known. Okay. How about if we talk aloud together? Just, um, what did we hear? What did we hear? Matt, you can advance it. The next slide. Let's talk with each other. Um, anyone want to talk to the whole group, or do you prefer to talk with each other? Each other. Okay, let's talk with each other. Turn and talk. What did you hear? Okay, thank you. It's never a convenient time to interrupt. But I ask that you pause just for a moment. And, and if you're like me, um, I, I try to spend most of my life asking, sometimes you have to have answers, but I try to spend most of my life asking questions. So um, when I hear something like this, I wonder I wonder what it must feel like to um, sometimes feel like you don't have ownership of your own body. I wonder what it feels like to you know, go to um, a particular school and then matriculate into another school that doesn't quite get where you're from. 
So I wonder a lot, right, when I read, when I listen um, to some of the stories that people's lives tell. Are you wondering anything? Anyone wondering anything right now before I move on? Yes. A couple of times we heard our elders told us that's why we would like to turn that So who were the elders and were they wrong? Mm -hmm. What was the guidance? I mean, the, there was a disconnect, but was the elders' guidance wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we're just wondering. I, I, I have an answer, we can talk about it, but I just want us to wonder. Yes, tell me your name, please. And your name is? Rod, Rod thank you. Yes. Hi. I'm wondering why we to our students the reason for education, why they're not understanding the weapon. Other wonders, yes, your name. Right. Yes. I wonder if we could, in the K-12 world, ever roll back to a time when whoever flawed citizenship was kind of the guiding purpose for popular education. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like so much of it we're pushing against uh, an academic assessment, testing regime, mm -hmm. higher ed all the way down. And I feel like teachers might surprise us if we return to a, a less myopic focus on achievement. Mm -hmm. Yes, your name. Yes. Yeah, I was curious about the talk about this being concealed rather than revealed. And, um, you know, what is that truth? And would we be comfortable discussing it if it were revealed mm -hmm. instead of concealed? Thank you, Sharon, right? Shannon. Shannon and Greg. Your last two wonderings, I appreciate all of the wonderings, but in particular, one thing I wanted to say is yes, I mean, the testing, hyper-testing regime that we're under is just really making it a difficult time to become a teacher. And if you meet a child that has grown up under NCLB uh, in the last uh, 10 or 12 years, you can see a lot of the absence of critical thinking. But what, the one thing I do want to say is, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, is historically, schools, even before hyper-standardized testing, never worked for many of our masses. That schools have always been oppressive. That schools have always been spaces to control the body, to control the mind, to, to prepare a particular group of people, mostly black, mostly Latino, mostly Asian, mostly poor, to serve our society in a particular capacity. So we have to look at that honest history as much as we see the testing as a new iteration of oppression, right? So this is what, um, and how do we then, when they come into our classrooms, how do we address that? Do we make space for that, right, Shannon, so that we could have those difficult conversations that many of us don't want to perhaps hear or even raise the level of consciousness? The thing about culturally relevant education, and we're going to get into three tenants, um, specifically uh, through Gloria Latson Billings, one of the tenants is to raise sociopolitical consciousness. And that can be dangerous when you raise the consciousness of your citizens. And it can also be difficult if your sociopolitical consciousness is not raised. As the young people say, if you ain't woke, how are you gonna wake up somebody else, right? So we need to think about all of that. Uh, yes, Matt. So um, I could hardly see from here, but um, these are some of the structural and institutional barriers, right, that um, are barriers to academic achievement. So we see police profiling, certainly, as one um, and particularly coming from New York City, uh, although we have, um, the police commissioner has so-called banned racial profiling, it is very much uh, still alive and well. In fact, I was still teaching high school about two years ago. I taught all boys for three years while I was teaching at Teachers College. And some of my uh, young men would tell me about how Tuesdays were sweep days. And what sweep days are is that they were standing in front of their building or in front of the school, it could be lunch break, and the police would come and they would just profile them. So they were just standing there minding their business, but because it was sweep Tuesdays, they had to, um, uh, I guess, do their job. 
So uh, underrepresentation in gifted and talented classes, I want you to think back to your own high school. Um, perhaps you went to a high school uh, with folks that look mostly like you, but if you went to a high school that had some diversity by way of race, class, and gender, who were in the AP classes? Who was absent, right? Who were the kids who were in the special ed classes for the most part? Who were the teachers in your school? Who were the coaches? Who were the janitors? Who were the secretaries? So all of this, right, creates these models that our kids grow up and they see. And it's difficult to see, to be what you cannot see in a sense, right? But even so, what's so pernicious is that if you have uh, students that go to a school, let's say what they say so-called minority, I really don't like that, that word because people of color really populate most of the world. But in this country, they're seen as minority. But what happens when all of your teachers are black? All of your teachers are Latino. And there's still those structures in place. So these are the things that we have to really uh, think deeply about. Also, um, underfunding of schools. Uh, that will do it every time. Political marginalization due to low income class status. So in New York City and in, in most cities and in the suburbs, your property taxes from your home um, determine the budget, the per pupil spending, right, for schools. So what if you are in an urban environment where you're living mostly in tenement buildings or in housing projects, like where I grew up, right? There's not much funding. So you're not going to have the same science labs. You're not going to have the same resources, right, that we all are supposed to then come and take the same exam, but we don't have the same resources be because we're from different backgrounds. And so it's okay to grow up in the projects. It's okay to grow up in the suburbs. But if we're talking about equity in education, then that's when our government really has to um, uh, think about equity in a different kind of way. So Jonathan Kozel has written about that in um, Shame of a Nation, and also um, his very first book, uh, what is it, Unequal, Savage Inequalities, right. So you know, we have, the, the one thing that we do well in the academy, we know how to document. <laughs> we know how to do research. Our challenge, right, is really pushing forward to try to what Gandhi says is to be the change that we want to see. But we keep on going. I use the Shawshank Redemption kind of analogy. If you haven't seen the Shawshank Redemption, the movie, try to see it. It's on Netflix. So you have the spoon, and there's the concrete wall, right? And the spoon breaks, and it takes how many years did it take for them to dig through that wall? 50 or 60 years? But they broke free. So as long as I'm breathing, I'll continue to do this kind of work with the Shawshank Redemption method. But there is a patient urgency. We can't wait 60 years, right? As Martin Luther King says, why we can't wait. But we have to continue going at it. Uh, there's also the perception of not being smart as. Um, and that is certainly solidified when you, you don't see yourself and your peers in AP classes and so forth. And uh, school curriculum does not reflect or value your home and community life. So those are some structural and institutional barriers to academic achievement. So I want us to think a little bit about cultural and personal barriers. And this is uh, some research that I conducted. I, I mentioned that I taught boys, all boys, for three years. And these are some of the young men from what I call the Yamoja Project. And I'm going to play a very quick video. What I want you to do uh, is to really pay attention to what you see and what you notice. And I ask you to do that because that was the framing of this project. I asked the young men one question. What do you think people see when they look at you? And what would you like them to notice? So of course, I make this distinction between seeing and noticing, right? It, there are huge differences between seeing something and noticing something. So um, I invite you to meet Andrew, Curtis, and Saul. I think why they see that, like why they see such a troubled kid or a kid that's like, you know, ahead in nowhere in life is because that's what they see probably where they come from or that's what they see on TV, that's what they see on the streets. So they just automatically label you. They, they don't get a chance to get to know you. They, they don't want to get to know you. They just see that and they're just like, or maybe it's the way I choose to be. Like maybe I choose to, maybe they look at the way I dress and they'll, they'll be like, oh, like, he's like that. But that's the way I choose to dress. Like I choose to come outside with my hair looking like this. But yet they probably think like, oh, he doesn't do nothing with his life. Like, oh, he doesn't care about life. So it's sort of like, if you think about it, they're judging you like they're judging a book by its cover. 
They're not getting to read the pages. They're not trying to get to know what the pages are. They just want to automatically judge it. People never assume that I want to be a cop. People always assume that I'm up to no good when it's not even really like that. When people look at me, I feel like automatically, they automatically think like I've been in jail, I've been in a gang or something, like I sell drugs, something just because of the way I look. Like I sag my pants and everything, but that's just because that's the way I dress. Automatically, when people see me, they assume, like for instance, cops, the minute they see me, they think I'm, they think I'm in a gang or I'm doing something illegal just because of the way I dress. Um, like, it, it just, or even if you sag your pants and you dress a certain way, that doesn't really mean that you're a bad person. That's just the way you see this shit think. And when people, what I want people to notice about me is like, I'm actually gonna do something in my life. I know for a fact that everyone that is around me notices that I'm actually gonna do something in my life. But the people that don't know me from a hole in the wall automatically judge me and say, I'm not gonna do nothing at all. When people see me, I think they, they see, uh, I, sometimes I get mixed signals, sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm being looked at like the criminal, and sometimes I feel like I'm being looked at as one of like the people, people like, you know, somebody to look up to. Hmm. So I, I, I get kind of confused. What I want people to notice about me is that, you know, I, um, I actually, I am very smart and, you know, I, I am responsible and I am mature and I, and, I, and I know how to act in certain places. And um, I just want people to know that, you know, I just, I'm not the type of person to, to look down at anybody. I want people to notice that, you know, I'm all about love. And I just want people to start showing everybody love. So let's just do this quickly together. What did we see and what did we notice? What did you see as you looked at Andrew and Saul and Curtis? And what did you notice? Yes, your name, please. Oh, the last one. My name's Doug. Hi, Doug. And it's striking because it's interesting if I say I just want something else, people to know love and so on. And that's not the vibe that, that I experienced in, in hearing his voice and seeing him. Right. Mm, nice. More noticings and seeings, please. Yes, your name? Ruth? Hi, Ruth. And, um, I three young men. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, do I need a mic? <laughs> um, uh, three young men wanting, uh, uh, looking like our students. I mean, they looked like our freshmen, sophomores. Um, I noticed the eye contact. Um, uh, Andrew had some eye contact, uh, Curtis, very little eye contact, uh, Saul, a lot of eye contact, and I, I found that fascinating. Mm -hmm. Nice. Other seeings and noticing, what's your name? Uh, Thane. Thane. He's noticing they're all in a sensitive memory, right? I mean, maybe they can convey something different when they need to, but sort of underneath that, there's a real sort of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. No, they're beautiful young men. I was completely blessed to teach them. Um, and every time I watch this piece, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois's work uh, just echoes in, in them. And that is two things where he says, what does it mean? How does it feel to be a problem? And also the double consciousness, right? And I don't know that it's fair that 14, 15, 16, 18, 20 year olds have to walk around with that level of double consciousness in terms of knowing who they are and always concerned about how they're being perceived. What does that do to the psyche? What does that do to the behavior, right? And Curtis in particular, who wanted to be a special victims cop um, in his neighborhood, and this happens in neighborhoods and societies sadly all over the world, uh, there was a predator who was raping young girls and that motivated him Right? When it happened to his niece, it motivated him to be on that side of the law. So what must it feel like to want to be on, quote unquote, the right side of the law, but every time you're seen by a lawmaker, you're already automatically perceived to be on the wrong side? What does that do to the spirit? 
right? What does it do to the spirit when our students come in our own classrooms, right? And there's no space for their stories to be told. There's no entry point for the curriculum for them, right, to enter in the way that makes sense for them. Any other seeings and noticings before we move on? Yes, tell me your name. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello. Yeah. Am I, I noticing a gender thing here? Oh, a gender All thing. the women need mics. I, None of the men are using the mics. Come on, people. No, mic. not you, Matt. Not you, Matt. Matt, <laughs> this is absent of you. You're awesome. If there were a talk show, Matt, you would get like the job. But right? And, and each woman said, hmm, do I need the mic? <laughs> Just saying. But, th <laughs> but thank you, thank you, you're doing a great job. Yeah. No, you are, Matt, you're um, awesome. Yeah, um, I was wondering, with Saul, he was the only one that even alluded to being viewed positively sometimes, and I wonder if it's because there's some ambiguity about his race. Now, to me, mm. he looks as well, but he was like, some people look at me this way, some people look at me positive. And I didn't know if it was his family, but the rest of them didn't allude to any like feeling viewed as positively. And I was just wondering if his level of, even though like one of the black kids kind of look biracial, one look black, I wonder if his appearance in the context of a white dominant society allowed him some, even though he didn't look white, allowed him some leverage. So I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. No, that's a brilliant seeing and wondering. Andrew is biracial. He's both black and white. Um, Curtis is a uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican, and Saul is Puerto Rican, right? Yes, your name. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like that deep voice on a woman. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, I was thinking about how much work emotionally and academic work that double consciousness is. And even in the classroom then, when you raise your hand and you say an answer and the teacher says, well, uh, expand on that, clarify it. There's this, this anxiety, oh, is it because my name's Saul or, or, am, I, or am I seen as black? Mm -hmm. So that, that all that work that has to happen that white majority students uh, don't have to do. Thank you for that. And, uh, and that's what I want us to be aware of. So whatever diversity it is that's present in our classrooms, keeping those things in mind. And that's why our community, even starting with life stories, I, I know that you know each other, but there's still much more for us to know about each other before we begin to talk about particular issues. So always keeping in mind, taking the temperature of our classroom, the way that we're delivering what we're delivering, also knowing that people learn differently. So that's another level of diversity. We're not talking about the, the multiple intelligences that people bring. Uh, so that's why I equate teaching very much with nursing and doctoring as God's work, because there is so much that is required of a teacher Right, that is not, and having been on the other side in corporate America, not on the other side, but a different side, <laughs> mm, I wouldn't want that to be the flip side of the coin, um, but just really seeing that there are things that are required of teachers um, that are not required of other people, right? There's a certain level of archeological digging that we have to do if we say that we're going to teach all people, all students, we have to do that level of digging to find out where do these issues live in us? What are my biases? Where are the ways and when are the ways that I look at people and I think racist ideas? And know that that is constantly, and it's in the air, it's everywhere. But how do you interrupt yourself to be able to see that child like a Saul in the complexity that Saul and Curtis and Andrew and so many others bring? Okay, so um, some s cultural and personal barriers to academic achievement. Uh, few publicized education role models, uh, internalized racism about ability, um, la and that is of course confirmed by uh, society. Society gives you the image that all of your folks are basketball players, and what do you, most young black men want to do? They want to be ballers. It's not always about the money, it's about a feeling of in inclusion. People want to have well-being and people want to be included. And one thing I want to say about uh, the beauty of, of hip hop, having grown up in the Bronx, hip hop started um, as a political uh, force, right? It spoke against police brutality, it spoke against the lack of jobs, it spoke against, particularly in the Bronx, what happened where the Cross Bronx Expressway 
by Robert Moses completely you know, tried to destroy the neighborhood. So when we talk about these social forces, oftentimes it is through music, right, Stephen, Stephen? Stephen, it is through music that people find a balm in Gilead. It is through music that people find a way to heal. And that is what you see pretty much in jazz and blues, but specifically for the generation that I grew up in, in hip hop. It's not just about a beat, it is about a proclamation of survival and a proclamation to speak back against the world that doesn't believe that you're worthy. So some of these personal barriers that are enforced by society, that are reinforced in schools, are then internalized and we see particular behaviors manifest. So uh, next. So how about when the lenses are nuanced? How about when it's multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual? Right? Another layer of diversity. So what I'd like for us to do is I have this next clip. It's about seven minutes, but it goes pretty quickly. And um, as you watch, I want you to think about your own families. I want you to think about the diversity that you grew up with or did not grow up with. I want you to think about your friendship circles, right? Are your friendship circles diverse? Linguistically, racially, socioeconomically. This is something other than other. <laughs> so what do you want to talk about? Well, I'll get my little Singapore story out of the way, and then we'll do Quinn's stuff. OK. OK. So I spent my first 16 years of my life in Singapore, where the majority of the people are Chinese. My dad is Chinese and my mom is Eurasian, which means that she's part Portuguese and Dutch and part Indian. Well, I guess I got a lot of Indian in me because I've got the darkest skin in my family. And I remember going to my grandmother's house on my, my dad's side, my Chinese side, every weekend. And I remember that she... <laughs> It wasn't on one occasion, it was on several, that she would come to me and she'd grab my arm and she'd go, Girl, you, <laughs> uh, your arms are dirty. <laughs> Got ducky, you need to scrub, scrub harder. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was the darkest in our family, but I mean, my immediate family kind of got the black sheep treatment in the Chinese family because we were the only ones who weren't all Chinese, you know? But yeah, that was a trip. I had an experience when I was a kid. When I was like nine years old, we used to watch The Brady Bunch and Dennis the Menace and me and my brothers would like fight, literally like fight to see who was Bobby or Peter or Greg. And you know, I always wanted to be Peter because I was sort of the middle. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting my hair to be like Peter Brady, but my hair was kinky and I had an afro, a big ass afro. The only time my hair would get manageable was after I took a shower. So I figured, well, I'm just going to walk around with this spray bottle all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, got, I used to fill up this spray bottle with hot water. And I would literally just spray my hair constantly all the time. And I'd just be walking around with like a wet head all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember that summer, I would always catch a cold because I'd go to sleep with like a wet head and be sleeping on the pillow with like, a, you know, my pillow would be like soaked in water. When Quinn was first born, we were in the hospital. Yeah. And um, the first, we, I, I had a C-section, so we were there for three days. And the, the nurses kept coming into the room and, we've got another test for Quinn. And they'd wheel him out and come back and wheel him out like eight hours later and come back. And it was always, you know, his color is, is not making me feel very good right now. I. I want to check. I, I want to check him for jaundice again because 
I don't know. His color isn't quite right. <laughs> but his color, you know, was starting to come in, you know, every yeah, day. Was, every he would hour get a little almost. darker, a little darker, yeah. a little browner, a little tanner. Yeah, and, so and I guess, like, oh, jaundice is coming in or something. Yeah, he was a little yellowish and a little dark, you know. Hello, have you yeah. seen the parents? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When we went looking to apply for a social security card, there was, um, you know, that area where you, you check boxes of your race, you know, and we wanted to check both boxes. We wanted to check black and Asian. What, what well, they we... said, please check one, and I think we were thinking, well, let's just check other. Other, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because, I mean, he is both. And if you can't have both, you might then... as well be an other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm definitely multiracial, so. And then, can't, I mean, <clears throat> if you wanna, you know, I am too. I mean, Henry, you how many Henrys <laughs> gonna walk around in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a dilemma for us, and we can laugh about it now. But at some point. Quinn's gonna have to face these questions. I hope by then this really isn't such an issue. I know that there are a lot of other kids in the world who are biracial or multiracial or whatever, and I just hope that by the time he needs to deal with it that there may be a box that says, you know, something other than other. I want him to grow up just being strong and confident and knowing that he's beautiful and that he never has to worry about who he is or whether he will experience, you know, similar to the ones that we went through or he doesn't, you know. Yeah, it would be fantastic if when he's asked, what are you? He can just look at him, square in the eye and say, I'm Quinn. I would love to circle back for a moment and think about the tagline of SPU, right? So we've seen, we've listened to an audio, we've seen two videotapes, we've stretched, I think, the definition of culture and diversity, I hope we have. But I would love for us to go back for a moment and think about SPU's tagline of engaging culture and changing the world. Where are your thoughts on that? Oh, I didn't expect you to laugh. <laughs> okay. Yes. Tell us your name. Yes. Matt's coming. Matt's coming. And say your name again. Katya. Hi, Katya. Uh, thank you very much for your engaging presentation. Um, I think one of the issues that this film makes us um, think about is to really expand and broaden the issue of culture to international and global. And the challenges are, of course, difficult enough domestically, as you have discussed, but as we think about globally, 
there are just so many more aspects. Right. And of course, we have international students and we talk about engaging the culture and changing the world. Um, so I was wondering, do you have any special suggestions on how to engage and work with international students and international um, backgrounds? Uh, is there something special, additional you would recommend? And also to what extent uh, the approaches that work domestically would also extend globally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. It's, it's both, Anne. I know this is not officially Q&A, but the one thing, this is where I will turn to the academy, and a good thing is that there is wonderful work that is done. Um, perhaps some of you in this room have written some of the research, but one of my colleagues in particular, Lynn Goodwin, who is a vice dean at TC and spends most of her time between Finland, Singapore, and the US. And I will definitely share with Assistant Provost Margaret Brown, I'll share some of her work. Um, so that's one thing, that there's a, a body, a robust body of research to help us think about these issues, and particularly in higher education. So looking at some of that research in higher ed. Um, but the other thing I want to address is really our disposition, our heart, and our mind. And so whether we're talking about our uh, black, Latino, Asian students, or poor students, um, or our international students, which is going to be a combination of many, I think we have to look at where our hearts are with this and our disposition in terms of how we treat them when we see them, how we welcome them or don't welcome them. There's certain, um, there's certain things that are just universally human, right? And the way that we, and this is what I love about culturally responsive and culturally relevant and culturally sustaining pedagogy, it's a humanizing pedagogy. It really does ask you to see who's in front of you in ways I think other pedagogies do not. So I would say checking our heart and our mind, doing that archeology span of the self, whether these issues live within us, but then also turning to the research, because uh, there is a lot there. Thank you, Katya. Engaging um, culture, changing the world, yes. And tell us your name. I'm April. Hi, April. Hello. Um, I think a lot of us have been bothered by engaging the culture. Um, I can I can understand it probably came out of um, the motivation to not be sort of Christian isolationist. You know, the traditional sense of Christianity versus the world. Right. So we're going to engage it. But obviously, the culture is monolithic. Um, and it also still has that overtone of its other. And it's not what we are. Mm. And that we're not susceptible to it. We're just, it's something that we're going to engage um, mm -hmm. <laughs> with our swords or something. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean, I know it's trademarked and everything, but we might want to tinker with it a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, April. You know, first of all, thanks for that brilliant analysis. I, I have to go to the words of Toni Morrison. And if you've not listened, I'd have to tell you, I have three spiritual godparents. Toni Morrison is one of them. James Baldwin is my other, he's my spiritual godfather. And my third, my second spiritual godfather is Malcolm X. And so these are the people that when I do this work and I engage with others, which I hope is through love, um, and telling truth in a particular way. These are the people that um, guide me. And so if you've not listened to Toni Morrison's Nobel Laureate acceptance speech, please do. 33 Minutes is on Nobel.org. And um, she takes up April, this idea of language and the power of language. And when we language something, we codify it. And then we often live up to what we said it's supposed to mean. And so um, to think about even tinkering with the tagline, and not just the tagline, that's just one example, but the way in which we language our syllabi, the way in which we language you know, how we share a particular concept in our class, the way in which we language conversations with students, these are, I think, the things that we have to keep in mind because we're always sending a message. And I think what I want to say here, particularly in a space where it is um, a Christian institution, that we want to, and this is not like in a conquering kind of sense, but we want to be on the right side of this. At the end of the day, when it's time for all of us to go home as we recognize what home is, what will be your legacy? How will you say you've taught? 
How will you say you've changed the system, you've changed someone's life? And I think that's something personal because we're all gonna be on different uh, points in, of this, but being able to Shawshank Redemption through racism, through patriarchy, through white supremacy, through all of these things that we know cause issues for our students, what side of this will we be on? Um, so I want us to always think about that. So uh, in the last 20 minutes or so, I'm just gonna move through. I wanna share this quote by Vito Perone. I have a lot of mentors. Uh, I never met Vito. He passed away about four years ago. He was a, a Harvard professor. But I know his work intimately. And this is a quote that is always uh, in my presentations and in my classrooms. And Vito said that we have struggled in schools and I want to say higher education institutions as well, to engage issues of race and cultural differences constructively. But we haven't yet learned how to speak about such matters embedded as they are with guilt, shame, confusion, superiority, and inferiority. Even as we tend to acknowledge that race and issues of difference need to be central to the curriculum, the curriculum is virtually absent. Our challenge is to make the school a safe, and I want to add brave, setting to engage in conversation and serious inquiry about race and cultural difference. If schools aren't such a place, where else will these conversations occur constructively? So I want us to think about SPU as an institution. How can these conversations be taken up in our classrooms, in our department meetings, in our faculty meetings? And I'll share a little bit with you of how TC has been, Teachers College has been doing that. So here's another question that I just want us to jot down and keep close to your vest. And maybe you can share this out at a, a, a meeting, the next meeting that you have with your program or your, your uh, department. So how do our systems, SPU systems, ensure success for all students? And specifically, how does SPU's policies and practices reflect high expectations of low income black, Latina, and Latinx. This is the new term, by the way. If you're not familiar, um, it used to be the at sign at the end to be inclusive of Latino and Latinas. But now um, uh, scholars and community folks have added the X, uh, very similar to Malcolm X in the sense of a demarcation or marking themselves a particular way. So um, reflect high expectations of low income, black, Latinx, and Asian students. So just take a moment to jot that down or just to do, if you wanna just close your eyes and do the jot down activity in your mind. Think specifically, if you can, about at least one policy. You know, this is so SPU being on the right side of this. We talked a little bit about some of the things that are being done with Susan and Margaret, but what are some of the policies? Not programs, but the policies and practices programs or the practices. Let's take a minute or so. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm moved to mention one thing about some of our Asian students. How many of you have heard of the term, terms either stereotype threat or the model minority myth, right? So when we think about high expectations, and particularly if you are in the sciences, you may want to interrupt yourself when you are thinking that, you know, if you have an Asian student in your class who might be struggling with the sciences, that you think to yourself, oh, well, you're supposed to be good at this. Your people are good at this. We might not say it, but we think it. And we have enough research that talks about the damaging effects, right? And certainly there are patterns. There are particular patterns that we can see in all cultural, racial, uh, multi-ethnic groups. But this is what I mean by interrupting ourselves, because what if you happen to have in your English class an Asian student that is amazing at poetry? Will you be able to see that in the same way um, with them being amazing at math, or if they say they want to be a poet and not a doctor? And so we might think that, no, no, we would never do this, but these are also the boxes. So stereotypes can be, um, what is it that Chimamanda Adichie says? If you haven't seen that TED Talk, please watch the TED Talk, A Danger of a Single Story. Incredible, amazing, wonderful. So we do have these single stories that we hold about each other and even about ourselves, right? But what she says about stereotypes, it's not that they're totally untrue, it's that they're incomplete. 
So we may see particular patterns that might reinforce a particular stereotype, but at the end of the day, stereotypes are really not good because they flatten experiences. They flatten people into one particular way of, of knowing and being. So I just wanted to um, have us then think about the other stereotypes or the other single stories that we hold about our students, whether it's connected to their zip code or uh, where they grew up, right? or um, coming from a single parent home. Because sometimes you can have both parents in the home, but sometimes the mom or dad is not present. Last night on the plane, I saw Manchester by the Sea. Powerful movie, powerful movie. And the mother was there. She had alcohol issues, right? Until, you know, finally she disappeared. But sometimes you do have both parents in the home, but it doesn't mean that they're fully present. So a lot of times when we hear um, someone grew up in a single family home, you know, sometimes all you need is really one good parent, although we would love to have both. But what are the single stories we have about those coming from a single father, um, which we don't even talk about that really. We rarely talk about the men who are raising their children, right? And we have certain stereotypes around that. Usually the type of mother that that mother was not. So these are all the tapes in our head that we have to um, somehow erase or interrupt. So how do institutions, how does SPU help students break through and overcome? And I want to argue that this goes beyond just the administration. And while the administration certainly is challenged with this, you think about your presidents, your provosts, your deans, the faculty who are on the ground, boots on the ground, if you will. No, I shouldn't use that analogy. Redact. <laughs> no. No war analogies. Um, but the, yes, no war analogies. Um, but the faculty members who are really every day, all of you with the students, you have a say in this as well. So the question is, what's the communication that happens between and among faculty and administration, and particularly around these issues? Can you overcome some of your disagreements to be on one page? I'm not making assumptions that you do, but I've worked for big institutions most of my life. And we know that we tend to go in silos. We tend to go departmentally. We tend to go programmatically. Taking on this type of work is going to require all of us. And all of us to communicate in a way that we just can't say it's the administration's goal or it's their job. It's all of us. So how can um, SPU help students who come from these backgrounds, and I say these backgrounds, not as um, always a fault of their own, but certainly socially constructed, right? I think we have to think about our historical literacy, and this is what I mean by interruption. When you see someone, you may want to put a particular story on them. I always say interrupt yourself and realize the historical literacy that you have to have. So you need to have historical literacy, you need to have racial literacy, Sometimes you need to have gendered literacies, multiple literacies you need to bring to the reading, right, of the situations that you're in. Next slide. So a culturally relevant approach, I'm gonna spend the last 15 minutes or so just sharing um, a culturally relevant approach to addressing barriers. And I wanna say one thing about the field. It has evolved just quickly in one minute. Uh, the field is recognized as beginning as a multicultural education, started with James Banks and Ch his wife, Cherry McGee, in the 1960s. Literally, there were places that were burning, right? So there were students of color saying, what about me? I want to be included in the curriculum. And so James Banks and his wife came along and tried to organize research around the movements that were happening. Um, right around 1980-ish or so, we see 1970, 1980, we see Sonia Nieto kind of pick up on the multicultural education uh, research, and she continues that specifically through teacher education. Also in teacher education, we see Gloria Latson Billings, her um, dissertation um, that eventually became a book, The Dream Keepers, right around 1985. And also around that time, we see Geneva Gay, who's at, uh, she might still be at the University of Seattle, Washington, right? UW, right? So her work on culturally responsive theory drops, a huge, huge book. So between Lats and Billings and Geneva Gay, sort of Lats and Billings talking about the practical, this is what it looks like in practice, and Geneva Gay talking about this, what it looks like in theory, but to wider audiences. She's including more of a linguistic, varieties and linguistic diversity. 
So this is what we see right around, I would say, 2014, enter Sami Alim and Django Paris. And these are scholars who specifically look at culturally relevant teaching and responsive teaching, but call it sustaining. So it's gone from multicultural education, culturally relevant, culturally responsive, which mean the same things, by the way. You know how we are in the academy. You know we have to try to like start our own thing, right? But honestly, when you ask Geneva Gay, what does she see as the difference between being relevant and responsive? She said, when you go to the doctor, do you want the doctor, if you're, you're sick, do you want the doctor to give you something that's relevant for what's wrong with you or what's responsive? So that's how Geneva Gay uh, distinguishes relevance and responsiveness. And in terms of sustaining, Sammy Aleem, who's a linguist of African American English, and uh, Django Paris, who is a teacher of students um, recognized as L, having L literacy practices, talk about sustaining the linguistic and the cultural norms and understandings of our students. So that's, in a nutshell, where the field has been. But if we look at ways that we can think about our own classrooms in terms of, next map, um, how do we take up the idea of culturally relevant? I, I want to just use Gloria Latson's, you know, Geneva Gay has eight principles, Gloria Latson has three tenets. And I gravitate towards the three tenets because it focuses specifically on high academic achievement. Oftentimes people think that, okay, it's a kumbaya type of way of being, that we cannot have high academic, you know, expectations while we're loving one another. Yes, both do, it's both and, it coexists. I can get to know you, you can talk about your culture, use that as an entry point as you're moving toward high academic achievement. Um, cultural competence, this is required of us. We have to be able to recognize uh, our own culture. Gary Howard, if you have not read his book, um, We Can't Teach What We Don't Know. Gary Howard uh, happens to be a white male who's been doing this work for about 45 years. And it started out for him in the 1960s when he was a student at Yale. And he marched down the hill because he was going to join the black people in protest. And they said, all due respect, brother, but we need you to talk to your people. And that shifted his life and the work that he did. So I've been using Gary Howard's book for the past, I would say, 12 or 15 years in my teaching. And he talks about, specifically if you identify as white, understanding what your cultural background is. And not just if you're Irish on St. Patrick's Day, having that symbolic, what they call symbolic ethnicity, that's the work of Mary Waters, but that you recognize that your culture is connected to something. Because oftentimes, if you identify as white, you tend to say, oh, I'm just normal. Or I just got American culture. Oh, I'm just me. What Howard is arguing is that, no, you have to understand that ethnicity, that culture, and the history that's connected to it. So if you, are, you identify as white and British, that's a particular culture, specifically as you interact with someone who's white and Irish. You have to understand the historical and the political backgrounds before you can open up your classroom and ask your students to tell their cultural stories. So a level of cultural competence is required. And then, of course, sociopolitical consciousness. I mentioned that earlier. Once you start opening up your classroom, which I try to do, the most painful thing is when students tell me what's not working. Oh, I'm confused about this. Oh, it said this on the syllabus, but I don't know. Oh, can we do this? Oh, can we change? Uh, they're paying a lot of tuition. And so I try to have my class be a space where I'm open to critique. And I, the critique I often get is, why are we always talking so much about black and Latino kids? I get that a lot. I have to address it. I have to have them tell me what's not working because once sociopolitical consciousness is raised, you have to be ready for them to critique you. And that's not comfortable, especially for academics. <laughs> right, y'all? Right. So anyway, these are the three tenets um, of culturally relevant teaching. Very layered, very sophisticated. But um, for those of you who identify yourselves as doing this work, you know that there are great rewards to it as well. Next. So um, this is a lot on this slide. I apologize. But what I wanted to do was on the left-hand side, just try to give some features, right, 
uh, and then uh, some connectors. So if it's personal connections, you know, what are some of the ways that you can invite personal connections, right? If we're talking about instructional methods and assessments, which by the way, Carol Lee, um, who is married to, um, formerly his name was Don Lee, he changed his name in the 60s to Haki Marabuti. Together they run Third World Press, which is I think one of the only, if not the only, uh, black presses in the country. Um, they have been running for about 30 years Afrocentric schools in Chicago. And Carol Lee has written probably the definitive book on uh, culturally responsive assessments and methods. So if you're interested in more of this, you want to look up Carol Lee's work. I think she's at Northeastern University. And then certainly student, students' diversity in the background. What does it look like um, to talk about this? What, what are some of the diversities? We've been talking about that today, socially, linguistically, culturally, uh, certainly academically and ability-wise. And content and resources. How do we begin to think about bringing in resources that reflect our students' cultural, linguistic, racial, socioeconomic background? Lewis Mall's work, which is uh, now being critiqued, um, but in the 90s when it was released, it was huge. And he talked about funds of knowledge, and specifically with Mexican American students, right? And how these were uh, young people who knew how to fix cars who parents knew um, how, to, how to treat ailments uh, with plants. Like they had this incredible funds of knowledge, but when they came to school, it was not honored in any kind of way. They were tracked into particular programs that oftentimes had no bearing on what they did really well outside of school. And then of course, critical reflection. And this is the hardest piece I think for all of us because when we hold up the mirror and when we realize uh, where these issues live in us and how many of us were raised, not just the time period we grew up in, that certainly has something to do with it, but also how we were raised, the things that were said around the dinner table that were just kind of normal speak. We realize that that has impacted and will continue to impact the way we see others. And uh, culture in the curriculum, if there is a curriculum that is relevant, students are able to make connections between and among the learning, their lives, their interests, and communities, and through conversation and reflection. And so what this means just quickly is, I know some of you may say, I've got like 12 different cultures represented in my classroom. How am I going to be the expert? You don't have to be. Remember, this is the disposition, right, Shannon? We were talking about earlier, it's the heart, and the disposition, the attitude that we bring to it that then opens up the space for culturally responsive education to take place. Um, students are able to explicitly apply their cultural connections between and among the learning um, and their lives, their interests, and their communities. Next. And so culturally relevant approaches, of course, support higher levels of achievement. That is the first tenant for Gloria Ladson Billings. I honestly can't see this, so I'm just gonna let you um, take it in. The one thing I do see and remember is the connection to outside services. So particularly if you tend to have a large number of refugees or immigrant students or those who have been labeled as immigrants, if it's not happening now, it may. What are some of the uh, community connections that you need to make on behalf of these students? Right, so the way that I make sense of it is when I taught in a community school district where there was a high um, level of, of parents who did not speak English as their first language. They spoke multiple other languages. But uh, it truly was a community district where we offered language services, we offered medical, uh, dental. You know, it was truly a community school. And we had to call on community-based organizations to help us. Uh, so we were um, inclusive of the entire family. So I'll give you a moment to take that in. And I specifically want to um, give a shout out to all of you over the past year and to Margaret and taking up these conversations um, around race, around culture. Uh, also, it's time to look at, and I don't know if it's because of region or if it's because of hiring practices, how diverse are your hiring practices? Sadly, at TC, I can count on both hands with fingers left over how many faculty of color we have. And this is in New York City. So the question becomes, this is where administration and faculty members have to come together. How are we trying to recruit 
And this is not the argument of affirmative action, let's just get anybody in the seat. No, that's not. And first of all, we know that affirmative action benefited women more than it did when people of color. But what are the conversations that are being had when there is an opening? How are you talking about trying to recruit diverse members? So that's the honest conversation that has to happen. Next. So um, a culturally relevant approach to teaching addresses the affective, and I know that might be difficult for some people who don't think that emotionality has any place in education, but I will tell you, when you open that space up, amazing learning takes place. Because sometimes there are emotions that block students from fully learning, right? And so if there's a space for that opening to happen, learning uh, can increase. A research in, in my own um, experience has shown me that. It requires and inspires self-reflection. I keep going back to that archeological dig. And it requires action. So it doesn't just rest in theory, but you also have to just try this out and be willing to make mistakes and have it influence your practice. So we're down to the last three minutes, but I do, I think I'm asking for some vulnerability here, which by the way, uh, that is also uh, part of culturally responsive teaching, right? We are vulnerable constantly, particularly if we feel that we are not as uh, skilled or educated about particular cultures in front of us. So I would just love um, if people or a couple of folks would be willing to stand up and talk about yourself for a moment. What do you think might be preventing you from teaching this way or might be an obstacle that you need to overcome? And for the administration to sort of listen and figure out, okay, well, what kind of programming like this do we need to continue to support our faculty? So is anyone willing to stand up to talk about what might prevent them? Either you just don't see a place for it, and no judgment here, because that might have been the way that you were you're educated in your programs, or you just don't understand how it would fit in. Yes, please, and tell me your name, and Matt is coming. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm a woman. I need a mic. Uh, but Matt, you know we love you, Matt. Can uh, so you actually hear me without the mic? Just I can hear it, yes. It's for oh, it's for the camera. Oh, it's for the camera. So that means we never got the men's questions. Uh, oh. Too bad, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell me your name, please. Uh, Ruth Ediger, oh, and Ruth, I'm in yes. political science. Yes. Um, I would say that... Uh, some of the challenges are larger than this institution, but are also part of this institution. And um, I'm teaching now, I've got four of my classes set up to be Q classes, okay. which are the cultural understanding and engaging. And I so appreciate all the resources and everything coming out of Margaret's office and everything yes. like that. My discipline itself is very white and male. Hmm. White and male. Political science. Sorry, guys. I know, yes, we have a few, you know, women in there, kick and yeah. sick kink, but really they do feminist stuff. Right. Um, and so trying to get, try, I'm, I feel like I'm, uh, to, to teach international organizations or to teach international law and to bring these in, it's just me out there trying to figure this out. Right. I have a new prep next quarter, one of these classes. I have all of spring break to clean up this quarter and do the next one. Mm. And I'm teaching time. one of the writing classes for the first time. And I don't have a heavy load, I have a normal load. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, and I'm on a couple committees because that's what they want senior faculty to do, which by the way, a plug for you senior tenure track faculty, I am not taking the chairmanship of curriculum committee next year. <laughs> Just so you know, everyone. You may want to, you need to know that the only option for taking that chair is for Chris Gritter to run again, or somebody who is wonderful but who is adjunct and not full-time, or pre-tenured faculty. Where are the tenured faculty on this committee? Hmm. Is it me? I'll take it my third year. I'm also on the blue team. Yes, I realize I've, I didn't need to volunteer for that, but where's the rest of you volunteering for this? Oh, research. When do I do that? I'm not sure. And my mother just moved in with me. Yes. Oh, gosh. So, <laughs> I'm a little busy. So, those are the challenges, institutional and larger, that yes. are facing me as I try to do this, this one word. step. I figure my theme is walk, don't run. Right. Well, Ruth, first of all, thank you, Ruth, for that level. That is a level of vulnerability. 
And um, what I want us to see is that we will all be able to come up with reasons why we can't, and very real reasons. Mothers load spouses, children, which is why it's not something that's added on. It's something that is internal, that over time, it just is infused in our practice. So I imagine, Ruth, that after spending a couple of years of doing cute classes, your practice will change. Things will change, but there are, there are very real reasons. And I go back, I hearken back to feminist movements, civil rights movements, any period in our history where we have made amazing change has always required sacrifice. And part of the sacrifice I, I want to share, as Ruth talked about her male colleagues, and Beverly Daniel Tatum talks about having allies, this is where allies are needed. This is why the archeologic archeological dig, when you realize that you might be a hindrance, that you think, how can I interrupt myself and change this? Because it is going to require everyone to do it together. So Ruth, I thank you for that level of vulnerability, but also hitting on the political aspect, the personal um, of what it is that we, we are facing. When you're trying to change the world, <laughs> It requires a lot of sacrifice. So I think that that's it. I think I have one or two more slides. It's 11.02, I wanna be respectful. If we can go and flip through, I just wanna quickly say, and I can share this with Margaret, uh, TC, after, uh, not only after 125 years, but has taken this work up in various ways. These are some of the ways that it's been taken up. We've had our students push back, certainly. Um, we've done a college-wide diversity climate survey where our students have really told us how they feel. Um, and it doesn't just stay there with the survey. If you look, there is um, a little bit further down, Reimagining Education Summers, where the college-wide, and this came out of our Sociology of Ed program, um, looked at all of the syllabi across the college that had a mention of race, class, gender, socioeconomic status, did an incredible mapping project. And starting last year, we now offer professional development for teachers and for faculty members around these issues. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is something that I created eight years ago, and it's been heavily supported by the provost. It's in the president's report. It's the racial literacy roundtables. It came out of what I considered failed teaching over the summer. I invited students to continue the conversation on race, and hence the racial literacy roundtables was born. I now am working through adding onto it. I call it the racial literacy project, where we have a lecture series, which is really performances. We have um, roundtables that are facilitated by middle school, high school, undergraduate, national and international scholars, always informal, we always have food. Um, moving to healing circles, where um, two clinical psychologists are listening to people talk about racial trauma that they've experienced in the sense of almost like a restorative circles, but these are healing circles. And finally, I'm trying to plan a racial literacy conference that if it happens, all of you are invited uh, to present. And finally, I want to um, not have you turn and talk. I'm gonna flip through and share this book with you. Uh, for those of you, I want you to think about your freshmen who are coming in and what kind of college preparation that they may have received. Was it culturally responsive? And when they come here, is it a huge culture shock? Again, playing with the word culture. And this is my colleague and her then doctoral student um, wrote this text. And finally, I wanna end with this quote. Uh, Jorge, who is in this book, said that I cannot stress it enough to you how important an education is in a person's life. We speak of college quite often at home, so you may get used to the idea of attending. This is just some of the work that people do in their homes around the dream of college, and it's wonderful for you to be there, to be on the other side, to help people realize their dream. Thank you for having me here. God bless you. <laughs>